Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Rising Strong Stories from Our Industry session for Event Wellbeing Day 2021. I'm delighted to be joined for this first session by Narmeen. Narmeen is a freelance event professional with 10 years experience in live and virtual event production and management, the host of Desert Island Events podcast. Her latest ventures have been the host of, um, have been founding the Hospo Book Club, a community working on personal development for you created diverse, created discussion on books. I'm not doing this very well, I'm sorry, apologies. Narmeen is very passionate about mental health and diversity and also personal development, all great things. She's also an ambassador for the Female Hospitality Network as well, which is another great community. Um, in this session, Narmeen is going to be sharing her mental health journey and from burnout to breakdown and how she's managed to overcome these personal and life challenges. So over to you, Narmeen. Thank you so much, Helen, uh, for that introduction. Um, hello and welcome to everyone who is joining us. So I am Narmeen and I'm going to be sharing my story with you all today. So hopefully you can see the right screen now. Um, so this is Beating the Burnout, which is the title of my session. So I'm just gonna start with saying 2,060 days ago, I attempted to take my own life. 645 days ago, I had a breakdown. And 428 days ago, I recovered. And this is my story. So, going with um, talking straight about that breakdown. Um, so I actually started a blog two years after my suicide attempt called Days Alive, just talking about how many days I had been alive since then. So I just want to share with you about what it's like to have a breakdown. So this is uh, dated from the 8th of June. So a little while after my break, about a week after my breakdown and it's called 1,425 Days Alive. So I've been wanting to write this for a few days now as I want to put my feelings into words after processing what said feelings are, confusion, emptiness and pain. Tuesday the 28th of May, I am exhausted and mentally drained despite having a good weekend at my best friend's baby shower. I have my four week checkup at the doctor's this morning before going to work to see how I'm doing resuming medication. We have the usual talk, how am I feeling, how is my day to day, how am I coping, etc. I am shaking. I am physically shaking and I didn't even realize it. Yes, I'm struggling with routine. I'm doing my best to keep on the same patterns, trying to do my best in all aspects of home, work and personal life, I tell her as I start crying and breaking down. You are physically shaking, she tells me before I realize I am. A few more questions later, I'm diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder on top of my de depression. Side note, I was also then diagnosed with panic disorder. We realize it has been pretty mild until recently when it becomes paralyzing until I'm having my routine checkup and I have a nervous breakdown right there at the doctor's with no warning or no trigger. You need a break, I'm told. I don't think I have a holiday until July, but I know I need one. No, you need a break right now, she tells me. Next thing I know, I'm given a letter saying I'm not fit for work for the next two weeks. I don't know what to do. This scares me even more. I know how busy work is and how much work I have to do. I am still crying and shaking and then it all goes blank and I wake up in bed. Autopilot mode, bare minimum functioning. I can't even remember last week now and that I try to reflect upon it. It really is a blur to me. Same goes for this week. I know my dad came home, Eid was on Tuesday. We had a lot of family over. I struggled with so many people Thursday, not so sure and so on. So many things happened, but I don't remember what happened. At university during my second and third year when I was severely depressed, my friends would know that I was particularly bad if I was on a shopping spree. Well, I would like to confirm that four years on, 26-year-old me at the time hadn't changed and retail therapy has always brought me temporary happiness as I was surrounded with um, Amazon boxes and deliveries. Over the past year, um, with my depression, I struggled to be social. I would go to work, come home, eat, sleep and repeat. 
I then took a massive leap and joined a pantomime. Over the winter, I was attending rehearsals after work and doing something. Life after panto, I carried on, seeing friends. I started to make plans on weekends. Normally, I'd stay in and watch Netflix. I wouldn't leave the house at all. It was helping my depression. I had my routine during the week, working with my set hours, with the weekends being my time to heal and rest. Me time. So making plans was not only a massive step for me, it was also increasingly scary to open up open myself up in front of people but I was healing it was helping me to bring out the shell I was normally hiding in now I don't even know what had happened part insomnia pipes part citalopram haze part nervous breakdown I feel like I've lost a small part of my mind between multiple panic attacks the type that are overwhelming debilitating and sleepless nights I'm trying to reset my body with increasing difficulty with only a couple of days left until my next evaluation and return to work I'm desperate to shake off the insomnia and fall back into my routine by trying not to think about what people will say I save myself from having additional panic attacks every day Lesson learnt the hard way where my first few days where I was filled with dread and anxiety, shaking and crying at home. Mental health is not black and white. Mental health is grey, so very grey. Just because I am depressed and have suicidal thoughts doesn't mean I want to die. It hasn't done so for 1,425 days. But it is always a struggle not to have the get up and go, the energy, the happiness that everyone else seems to have. My mother believes if I find God and become religious again, this would all go away. I'd like to argue the serotonin levels in my brain are nothing to do with God. And should he exist, I would like to ask him where my serotonin is because I currently get it in a 20 milligram pill at 6 p.m. every day. Um, Another reason for the exhaustion is the mask I put on. No one wants to hear about the depressive Narmeen, so I put on the happy face and smiling Narmeen for as much as I can handle. Family, colleagues and friends all get that mask, but it is exhausting hiding how you're really feeling mentally. And still, I go put that mask on day after day, day after day, until I break. So that was um, me writing about my breakdown and shortly afterwards. So on the 2nd of July, I wrote another piece. So this is the second piece I'm just going to share with you. And this one's titled 1,449 Days Alive. And this is basically what's going inside my head. And I just want you to understand, like, this is how I felt with my breakdown, with my depression, with my burnout, with my anxiety and my panics attack. So one, had a panic attack at the thought of being social. Two, cried because I wanted to be social. Three, anxious because I don't think I was wanted at this social. Four, cried because I went out and came home an hour after my bedtime. Five, panicked because I didn't know if I was happy, sad or sad crying. Six, had a productive day at work and felt happy. Seven, had a panic attack in the work toilets for 15 minutes because I forgot my password. Eight, wondered if I was always this useless. Nine, wondered what the world would be like without me. 10. Cried because I wasn't suicidal. I just didn't want to exist at times. 11. Realised no one would care if I shrugged it off. 12. Surprise house guests. Hello anxiety. 13. Forgot to wear, wash my hair for eight days because I was depressed. 14. Beat myself up for several days in a row for not going to the gym. 15. Stopped caring about the gym. 16. Felt sad. Ate food. 17. Felt sad. Felt empty. Ate food. 18. Felt happy ate food so that's just basically a list that goes on um about everything I was feeling during my burnout and my anxiety and my depression so this all happened back in 2019 and I actually did recover at the end of 2019 so I actually did um as you can see from my screen I used to like share things on social media uh, but privately about how I was feeling so you can see left work in tears really depressed today in a pub crying with wine almost slept through the whole night not even close 317 and there's a lot of these so I during that time I wasn't able to sleep at all I was so anxious worried about everything especially being signed off work as well which added to the worry because work was one of the main causes of my breakdown and um, because we know about how stressful work can be and the fact that I didn't take action and I also wasn't supported like I was on medication since August 2018 and I had told my workplace um and I don't think I really got the support I needed because come April, I was back on medication and 
a month later, I had this massive breakdown. And whilst I was originally signed off work for two weeks, I actually ended off work for nearly uh, six weeks in the end because I kept getting, I kept being told I wasn't fit for work by the doctor. Um, because when you are signed off for work, only when the doctor says you're able to go back, you can. Um, and even during my phase uh, phase return to work, I, I couldn't handle it. And I was off again for another week. So these were some of the things that I used to share about how I used to feel during my burnout. So yes, I'm in bed, I didn't, but I didn't have a single panic attack today. So that's progress. Like that is those things that happen. Like there used to be days where I just wouldn't leave my bed. I wouldn't be able to. I also don't have much memory of that time as well. So I was about to leave. Like you can see, I even got like, I've done my makeup. So I was like ready to go out, had a panic attack, got back in bed, back to square one. So like when I had this onset of uh, really bad anxiety after my breakdown, I was also having like multiple panic attacks a day where I wasn't able to do anything. So my burnout was like so severe. I obviously also had like, um, I was already depressed and I was already on medication for that. Um, but for me, like there were other factors involved and it just like culminated to a point where I wasn't able to handle any, anything and this is what had happened to me. So you can see I had plans today, having a panic attack and hiding, hiding in bed was not on the agenda. So that was basically me. But luckily to say um, the medication did work um, having the time off work did work so being unfit for work isn't a bad thing like it gave me the time I needed to recover and heal so at the end of so in July they say um when you start to feel better it takes six months to come off the medication and this was the first time I actually completed my course of medication as well so in July I started to feel better and um, so this is literally like uh, from the 28th of May to July so we were only like this for a few weeks and um, so I basically recovered went back to work and I was I was good it's still a process but that's when I started to feel really more comfortable and better within myself to the point where I came off medication at the end of of 2019 so I went into 2020 uh with no mental health conditions and I'm lucky like so glad to say I got through 2020 as well with no mental health conditions I did lose my job I was on furlough for a few months I lost my job but things were so like I was so much happier mentally um, and learned doing that in 2019 actually prepared me for 2020 to be mentally strong so what did I do in 2020 well I left the country for four months this isn't something I'd ever considered doing but back in um back during my furlough I did so much volunteering I was a volunteer project manager and it was one of those things where I wasn't doing it to keep myself busy and to keep myself in a routine. I was doing it because that's who I am as a person. And there's a difference when you realize, oh, I'm doing things to like keep me sane, keep me happy. Because at one point in April, um, I when we were in lockdown, I did think and I called the doctor up and I thought, I can't get, I'm not going to be able to get through this. And they gave me a prescription and I never picked that prescription up. I just continued and I've, I've been OK. That was just me being like a little bit cautious, a little bit anxious, but I kept to a routine. I, I put, put myself out there and I carried on. So in August, after I lost my job, I went to uh, Dubai and Pakistan. I was meant to be a seven week trip, but I actually stayed out there for four months and I came home in December, 2020. And we're now uh, at the start of March. So a lot of things have happened since then. So as Helen was saying, I did launch a podcast. I uh, started a small business. I have gone freelance and uh, I have been doing a lot of speaking opportunities. And I've also just been shortlisted for an awards of Excel award for excellence in hospitality uh, for community engagement. So lots of things have happened since then. So whilst my journey was a was a long time uh, coming, if you can consider me from back from my university days back in 2015 and struggling and being on and off medication I finally recovered and I don't know if it was like the full-on burnout that took me to like actually take everything seriously and recover but I did actually fully make a recovery Sorry, I made this. 
So I made this <laughs> TikTok back um, at the end of 2020 just to show how uh, how good 2020 was. This is a picture of you in December. So January wasn't too bad, but then. But that was just me trying to show like how good 2020 was like even at the start like sure I was still recovering and we all have our bad days and um, but I ended it ended the year happier than ever so this is where I am at now um, I'm definitely really happy I am also now trained as a mental health first aider and I wanted to say that that is something that's so, so important in our industry. And I wish that we had these things um, where I worked, because I don't think I would have gone through any of this if um, I didn't have this like pressure from work, had support from work. And if we had these like um, processes in place, because, you know, I had my mental health conditions for a while and I wasn't supported. And even though like we try and speak up, we don't know how to. So that's one thing I wanted to like try and say and change. Like may I wouldn't have gone through all of this. And maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't have, but I didn't have any of this support in place for me. And we all know about the pressures of work and um, whether that is um, deadlines, managers, we know how stressful the events industry is. We've got our peak seasons. We have like immensely busy days, long days. And I think um, when someone is already struggling, we need to sort of assess what kind of um, situation should we be putting them in? Or do we need to be putting them on a schedule to like keep some normality and help them and not to push them too far? So that's what happened to me. Um, but I think that's basically it. Like I, I burned out, I suffered. I was really, I had all of these emotions. I was writing about it to process it at the time, but that's what happened. And you should like trust the process because I didn't think where I am now is where I would like would have been like last year, last year, uh, this time last year, I, was struggling with work still I even though like I was recovered I was struggling with work but um I was also I didn't think I was also told I couldn't speak at an event and now a year later I am speaking at multiple international events I have my own business I have my own podcast and none of this was ever on the cards for me so I think it's just a wonderful way to say like you never know what the future is holding and sometimes like things happen for the best and things do get better. Um, but that, that's basically my story, if anyone has any questions. There we go. Thank you so much, Narmeen, such an inspirational story. And, so, and a pure example as well, where you were saying there, you know, you make your own stage. Don't listen to the naysayers, I call it, kind of stuff. You make you make your own journey. You make your own stage. If, if speaking at events is something you want to do, you know, create your own events where you can create your own stage and bring your own people and tribe with you. Kind of stuff. So such such an inspirational story. I, I have tremendous respect for for everybody who has that that bravery to be able to talk about their own mental health and and show the vulnerability and human side if that makes sense so thank you so much for sharing that with us and i mean we've got a couple of questions for you yeah so first ones come in that what do you think made the most difference to your recovery and anybody else that's got any questions pop them in the q a and we'll share them with nami now so yes yeah, so what what do you think made that difference to your recovery so for me, I had been on and off medication, but I was terrible because I would never remember to take it. Um, so back in 28, August 2018, I went back on medication because I, I know myself, like I know when things aren't good, but I felt better because I was being social and doing things in the December. So I stopped taking it. But then in April, I went back on it because obviously I, I, I should have completed the course. So for me, finally actually completing the course of medication and listening to the doctor was a good start um, and taking it seriously because I never thought I'd be the person that got signed off work for not being fit to work because of this. 
and that whole breakdown like being in the doctor's office and not remembering anything and you know suddenly I'm like waking up in my own bed so that kind of made me realize okay things really aren't right and that pushed me to like make sure like I had alarms set on my phone every day for my medication I'd make sure I take it I had friends supporting me as well I had this one wonderful friend um who was also off work at the same time um uh, looking for a new job so I had her support a lot of the time as well and she got me out of the house we were like meeting up so it was a good process I had a wonderful like support bubble uh, around me and actually uh, taking my medication definitely helped as well yeah absolutely medication it, it's, it's not for everybody I've, I've been on left off medication for 30 years with my own bipolar that I manage so it's not for everybody good, but it can definitely be a big help and definitely when you're in those those periods and the the support as well from friends and family which was a question that I wanted to ask you because you'd mentioned that at the start of the story in terms of your friends and family didn't want to see depressed nor mean I, I had that I've had that over the years with my personal mental health story as well so how has that changed are they more open to talking to you about your mental health now checking in on you to see how you're doing how, how is that so my friends yes absolutely it's like some of my friends they know everything whether they're new friends or old friends like we're very very open about this and I can just talk to them and go to them and be like hey I'm not doing okay like uh like honestly I actually had a panic attack last Friday or two Fridays ago that's the first time in a while why because things have been going so well for me my brain was like are you sure you're okay <laughs> So I like basically panicked myself into having one, um, but I'm fine. It was just a moment of like strange weirdness, but my friends are absolutely amazing. Like I, I am very open and honest with them and we like do talk things out, like uh, how are we feeling? What's bit, like good, what's working? And just having like someone there, like sometimes we will just be on the phone, but like not talking. It's like having someone there as well. Um, but also like routine, because obviously that was a big change in 2020. Yeah, amazing. Is that? And good to see that that, is, that that has changed as well, because your support network and your friends and family can be so important, can't it, when you, you're managing a mental health condition, it can be very important yeah. to you. Um, and that check-ins. We, we talk about it a lot, checking in on each other, you know, particularly in times of difficulty. And that's one of the biggest things we can do for each other. So as colleagues and peers in our industry at the moment, is just check in on people. You know, not for anything else, but just to kind of check in. We're going to be talking to Jack after Narmeen. So Jack's going to be sharing his story as well. And then Jack is my check-in person. He constantly checks in on me, which is which is amazing. It, it's one of the biggest supports that you can you can get from people. And it just kind of reminds you that there's people out there that, that love and care for you. And that's really important, isn't it, Narmeen, to have that yeah. kind of reminder. A hundred percent. Like it's, yeah, just someone that can be like, no but how are you actually feeling and I can be like okay well this is happening and this is happening I'm not too sure how I feel about this but then this and you know just having someone as a sounding board and someone that knows you and knows your behaviors as well yeah yeah don't don't underplay guys how how big a difference that can make to somebody's day particularly if they're in a dark place so um, check in on each other definitely um, another question for you, lovely. So other than having a mental health officer appointed and tracking workload, is there anything else a company can do to support us, employees, their team? So mental health first aid, so other than having a mental health first aider? Yeah, I think actually having more open lines of communication about mental health, because it seems to still be like very hush, hush. And um, so I think that's like one uh one problem we're facing already mm. I know like my mental health condition was like kind of dismissed and so talking personally now like my the day I was signed off work one of my colleagues was asking like where I was um and someone said oh uh, she's off sick for a while and they asked what's wrong and they was like nothing it's just mental thing like you know just dismissing it I think we need to start taking these seriously and having these conversations that, you know, these things are actual, actually important. And, you know, also it wasn't nice to have, like actually hear like that everyone knew because this was just like set out in the office. Um, 
but that you know we need to talk about it like in a positive way you know how can we help how can we address things because we all have mental health and you know we are working a stressful job but it shouldn't be normal to be going through these things and we should be like talking about how we're feeling and not just brushing it under the carpet absolutely and that's so important isn't it having those open channels of communication just having open conversations but that's would you agree kind of that feeling of safety yeah absolutely like I didn't actually tell work about uh being on medication until about a couple of weeks in and um, just because I didn't like I didn't feel comfortable and also the culture around companies like if people don't feel like they can openly talk to you like they're not going to be able to like to share and discuss these things like if you have like a very like cliquey uh, you know groups and so on like with where people managers and people fall into you're not going to be able to just openly be like oh so I, I have depression um severe depression like it's one of those things you're not able to just do yeah absolutely culture we talk about it event well an awful lot culture has such a massive impact for how people feel at work how open they feel it can be whether or not they have to wear a mask when they go to work and they, Nami mentioned that as well that pretending to be someone you're not on those days where you just feel like you're not having it and we, we talk a lot about what employers can be doing to support employees and you know culture at work isn't just your employers and the bosses it's everybody who works in an organization yeah. as well. so what can colleagues be doing do you think in the workplace to support each other better because they're part of the culture equation yeah. so yeah just asking people how they are like I'm not saying you need to be like best friends with people but you know actually being able to openly ask them how are you doing or, uh, and you know recognizing these signs which just goes back to like mental health first aid is, is you know recognizing signs if like someone's not doing okay like I would go cry in the basement toilets <laughs> so we had like in our office we had these like toilets in the basement I would sometimes just disappear and go cry for 15 minutes downstairs um, and I've done that on several occasions which isn't which isn't okay um, and then you know I did have like a couple one like one person who I could like kind of speak to um, so like she would know like anytime I had like a rough moment like I would be straight outside to have a cigarette just because that was my way and um, terrible habit but that was like my stress like I had to take myself out of that space because I didn't feel comfortable in that space so that's another thing like having a safe working environment because like at times I didn't feel like I was like wanted or like there at all so I had to take myself out whether that was crying downstairs or going outside for a cigarette I had to take myself out of that environment yeah absolutely and the, the point that you made as well about the fact that we all have mental health so just to add on Narmin's point as well um, think about that culture in the workplace so if you're somebody who doesn't take your lunch break um, who sits at your desk for eight hours who always works longer hours than you should be doing um, think about you know that that culture effect that that goes off because if you're doing it you'll find that your colleagues and peers will copy you so we all kind of have that responsibility like Narmeen said to be checking in each other but we also have a responsibility in terms of how we're looking our own, after our own mental health particularly if you're a member of a team so in order to better support actually to in order to better support each other we need to take better care of ourselves if that makes sense because yeah, you know, human beings, we're tribal people. We, we copy each other. We like to do things that our peers are doing. It makes us feel accepted and part of the group, if that makes sense. So if you're taking better care of yourself, you'll find that your colleagues and peers will take better care of themselves as well. It's like a snowball effect. It's having a massive impact on culture. Um, keep on putting your questions into the Q&A. We'll do about another five, I think we've got about another five minutes to go and then we'll be taking a break before we kind of speak to... Jack, so pop your questions in there for us. Um, you mentioned memory as well, Narmeen, and I wanted to chat to you about this as well, because this is quite interesting. So this, this guys, in terms of people experiencing poor mental health and losing memory and stuff like that, we could do a whole session on this and the science and biology behind it. So I mean, if you ever made the connection that your, your lack of memory was, was linked to the sleep, Patterns. yeah so I had a lot of like memory loss um 
I just want to say like obviously like I've been like 400 428 days recovered I don't know I just put in the random date of end of 2019 I don't actually remember the exact day in December I stopped but um like even now that I'm doing so well I still have like moments I'm not saying like you know it is enough for me to like be re re-diagnosed and to go back on medication because I know for me medication did work um it's different for everyone but like I still have moments like I gave myself a panic attack the other night because everything is going so well for me I was like that like what um but then yesterday I, so I'm like an organized person I have six pastel highlighters um in my pen pot and I couldn't find one of them and I drove myself mad I was searching my entire desk and it, it gave it panicked me thinking oh my god have I lost my memory again um but it is one of those things like your memory is like very very hazy because of what you went through and I I sort of remember being at the doctors and I sort of remember like calling work but no one was like uh, like the people I need to speak to weren't there so I spoke to someone else and left a message and I just remember waking up in bed like and that's what the next few days were like um and I was sleeping a lot but I was also waking like it was all random times like I would always wake up at like half past three in the morning for some reason no matter how much I tried and either than having a panic attack like anxiety attacks like the memory was it was all gone it was like all over the place that's kind of why I try to write things down to like a remember how I was feeling what I was doing and um, because it is scary like not remembering and that's like one of the that's one of like the hardest parts for me is not being able to remember yeah and just to just to explain a little bit so I just wanted to share a little bit of the science behind what happens when you're experiencing poor mental health and your sleep is hampered and why that affects your memory sleep is one of the most important things for your memory um, and REM sleep is the process of sleep that stage of sleep that is most important for memory so if your sleep is affected and you're not going through the all four there's kind of four stages to sleep so you've got your, your deep sleep your light sleep your REM sleep and there's also the kind of you know, almost call it like an aroused kind of sleep where you're kind of semi-awake because you, know, you don't sleep continuously for the eight hours that's kind of built into our safety mechanism of when we used to sleep in caves and you used to be saber tooth tigers and stuff around. So it would literally, you, it's almost like you become aroused to almost get a sense of your surroundings and you go, you go back into people. But REM is really important for memory. That's why if you have a lot to drink, so if anybody has a night out and they have a lot to drink, they wake up the day after and they kind of go, I can't remember anything, what happened? It's because alcohol interferes with REM sleep and REM sleep is your memory processing stage of sleep so if you're struggling with your sleep and you're not going through all of those four stages of sleep it can have a real effect on your memory more than anything else I've, I've had bipolar for 30 years since I was 16 um oh 32 years sorry since I was 16 15 16 and there's lots of stages over my life where I can remember doing things but I can never tell you the details at all and that's just one of the things for people who manage mental health conditions, you will find that with them. And it, it's just it's just one of those processes of poor mental health, unfortunately, in managing mental health conditions. I just wanted to share a little bit of the science there. That's right. Um, another question for you. Do you feel, and we'll, we'll finish on this question because I think this is a really nice one to finish on actually, because I'd, I'd like this as well. Do you feel that tracking your journey through your blog posts and photos, has that helped your journey? yes um because it gives me something to reflect and to look back on and um with the blog post I am actually writing a book now out of it all <laughs> so if anyone wants to help hold me accountable I am actually um turning my entire journey into a book I've got about 20,000 words so far that I wrote on boxing day so hopefully by the end of the year I might like publish a book <laughs> it's definitely helped 